going to be in Amos chapter 7 this evening. Amos chapter 7. In the beginning of the chapter, we have a few visions that are given to Amos by the Lord. We see as well, uh, as a result of seeing two of those uh, two of those visions that Amos pleads on behalf of Israel uh, for God to withhold his judgment upon them. And then uh, with the third vision, we see the Lord uh, making a statement that he will, uh, even though he withholds those uh, judgments, the Lord is still going to take action because of Israel's sin. And the Lord can no longer walk on by without taking notice. Then as well, in the second half of the chapter, we see Amaziah, the priest, uh, basically trying to uh, kick Amos out of Israel and to get him to go to uh, Judah instead of sticking around and causing more problems and preaching against uh, the sin of Israel. Of course, then Amos responds by saying, I don't care about my own well-being, I care about the Lord's uh, will and what the Lord has decided. So before we get started, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we'll dive right in. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have to approach you and to seek your face as we study your work, as we study it and learn from it, Lord. I thank you for your word and its wisdom that it offers to us, the knowledge that is given to us if we would hear it and we would respond to it, Lord, that it can change our lives for the better and further your kingdom. I pray that you would open our hearts to your word right now, help us to remain focused on your word, that we would uh, learn from it, and we would understand it. As you guide and direct me, as I share your word, that everything will be for your honor, your glory, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin in verses, uh, we'll read the first few verses here and then we'll go back. Chapter 7, starting in verse 1, it says, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter grove. And lo, it was the latter grove after the king's mowings. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the lamb, then said, O Lord God, then, said, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented of this, and it, it sh, report, repented of this, it shall not be, saith the Lord. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented of this, uh, repented for this, this also shall not be, saith the Lord. The first two visions that we have here that Amos perceives are uh, very intense visions uh, showing great destruction on the part of Israel. The verse that we see taking place in verses 1 and 2 speaks of a famine that was going to come apart and was going to be uh, basically come about through the Lord, creating grasshoppers or, or locusts that would come and would eat of all the grass and uh, cause a, uh, a shortage of it. We see here that it actually gives a little details as to when it would take place. It talks about it coming as uh, coming during the latter the latter growth and after the king's mowings. Uh, something that takes place even today with uh, the, uh, the crop hay or, or grass is oftentimes those that are trying to produce the most will uh, provide, will take two cuttings off of the field. The first one being uh, in later spring, early summer, and the second one being late summer, early fall depending on how things grow. First one was typ is typically the bigger of the two harvests, uh, 
but the second one is just as important for it. We see here that it talks about this plague of locusts or grasshoppers coming upon them at this second cutting. It also defines it as being after the king's mowing, so the king likely always took his cut uh, with the first cutting. We see here that as a result of it, it ends up being a very uh, huge famine that takes place. And Amos, upon seeing it, he asks of the Lord to forgive and to withhold this judgment upon Israel. And he, he, his reason for it, he says, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise for his small? And we'll get back to this in a second, but first let's look at the other vision. And verses... In verse 4 we see as well, the other one it says, Thus hath the Lord God shown unto me. And behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. This other judgment that would be poured apart is fire upon them. And it speaks of the fire being so great that it uh, devours the great deep. And this description here would be a, a great body of water, likely... Uh, referring to even the Mediterranean. Uh, but it, it speaks of this in the fire being so great that it devours the water and consumes it. We see an example of this actually taking place when Elijah called down fire from heaven when going up against the uh, prophets of Baal. And he goes when it's his turn to call down the fire. He has them dump a lot of water over the altar. Uh, basically, Aiden has them build trenches around it, and it, it's just overflowing with water. And then he tells them to put even more on it. Whenever the Lord's fire comes down, it actually consumes all of the water and the altar, completely destroying it and consuming it. And it just shows the intensity of the fire, and that's something that normally uh, quenches it or slows it down at least doesn't even hinder it at all, as if it's not even there. We see this fire as well is described as uh, eating up a part of Israel. Again, though, Amos requests of the Lord and says, O Lord God, I cease, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. In both of these cases, Amos, he speaks to the Lord and requests him to withhold his judgment on the part that he believes that the judgment to be too great upon Israel for it, it to be able to come back from it. It's a, a too great of a burden for Israel to have to bear. We notice here within it, though, he does not ask the Lord to ignore the sin, but to forgive the sin. The sin is not being uh, justified. The sin is not being allowed. It is being forgiven. We see in both cases of these, in verse 3 and also verse 6, we'll read verse 6. It says, The Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord. In the case of both of these, after Amos makes a, uh, after <clears throat> Amos requests of this, uh, the Lord decides not to put it upon them. It tells us that the Lord repents of this. Something I want to point out of these, oftentimes when we hear the word repent, we think of it as in relation to sin. Because that's most of the time when we talk about repentance. We talk about it in the context of sin. The need for every single person to turn away from their sin, to repent of their sin and turn away from it and to turn from the Lord. But repentance just basically means to turn your mind, to change your mind. In it. The Lord here is not changing his mind because of it being a sin. It was not wrong for the Lord to do this. But because of the request of Amos, he decides not to. <clears throat> we 
we see within this the evidence for us that our prayers do matter. Our prayers are important. Oftentimes we, the question can be there that, well, the Lord knows all. He knows the future. He knows what's going to happen. It's, he already understands what is going to take place there. So what, what good does our prayers make in changing things? How, how does it affect it? And this is the thing we have to remember. The Lord, even though He is, he, he knows all the time, and, and time does not exist, He already knows what's going to take place in the future. Hence why He can give us prophecies that are 100% fulfilled. The Lord still responds to us in our time. He knows the potential paths that can happen. What He shows Amos is a potential path. But as a result of Amos' uh, intercession for Israel, that future is no longer there and a different future takes place. The Lord knew that Amos was going to make the intercession and that he was going to make that request and the Lord was, knew he would honor that request. Because we know that the Lord because the Lord has this uh, knowledge of what is going to take place, though, it can provide peace for us in knowing that whatever the Lord's answer to our prayers, our requests, that they are what is best for us in the end, though. We can still trust Him that even if our prayers are not answered, it is what is, it is the best plan for us. In these cases, though, the Lord decides to grant Amos' request. We actually have scripture in the New Testament that talks about James chapter 5 and verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We see other indication, other places in scripture as well. Uh, in Moses uh, intercedes on behalf of Israel a few times, uh, and the Lord grants those requests. So our prayers do have an effect on the outcome of our circumstances. We need to be seeking the Lord. As we continue, though, there is one last vision that he gives to Amos. Israel isn't getting off completely scot-free. <coughs> Verse 7, it says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So we have here within this, God, God gives Amos the vision of a uh, plumb line, and could you hand me that? I had to send my wife out to get this because I forgot it in the car. But instead of trying to describe to everyone what a plumb line is, I figure I'd just show you. So basically a plumb line is they would take a string and you'd hang a weight to the end, and it shows you what a straight plumb line would be. Oftentimes we refer to this as being a level line, but level is horizontal, plumb is vertical. Oftentimes the places this is used most would be in constructing a, a wall or setting something directly over top of it. But using gravity and string and weight, it gives you a straight line. The Lord here is standing upon a wall here, and he says that this wall is made by a plumb line, and he has a plumb line in his hand. So by talking about this wall and being made with a plumb line, it refers to this wall being made perfectly plumb, that it's straight up and down. It's, it's assembled, it was built perfectly. As we continue on, we see that he tells us 
that he's going, that Israel is the one that is being measured by this plumb line. Which means that Israel is this wall that he's standing upon. Israel uh, was built and established by the Lord. We see as well early on in their history, especially with uh, David, they are established by with a righteous king following the Lord's plan. They're brought to their glory, their, their strength is made because of being God's nation and being a nation that followed the Lord. So at one time, they were a straight wall, or a plumb wall. But now, the Lord is going to measure them again with the same plumb line. It says in verse 8, And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then, the, then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of of my people Israel, I will not again pass by them any more. Now Israel, because of their sin, was no longer plumb. They're no longer straight. The wall has sagged. The wall has bowed. It's no longer the straight, mighty, strong wall that it once was. The Lord is saying, "Say, I'm, I'm going to measure Israel." I'm putting this plumb line, plumb line in the middle of them, and it's going to show their sin. It's going to show their crookedness. It's going to show the problems. This is the standard as a foreign. And this plumb line rep, uh, represents God's righteousness and God's judgments. He's saying, I'm, I'm showing this, that Israel is not true. They are not following me. And I am no longer going to ignore this. I'm sure you probably have all seen a retaining wall <coughs> at some point. You've seen some that are straight and strong. And you've probably seen others that are falling over. A lot of times those walls that are falling over, I mean, they're not all that bad. They're, you can walk by it and not notice it. It can go a little bit farther and you may notice it, but you can continue walking by it, not taking, not caring about it. Allowing it to stay. It's not bad enough to take action on. The Lord, though, He has placed the measuring stick next to Israel, and it is no longer, He can no longer go on not taking action on the condition of Israel. It has gone too far. His hand has been forced. He's no longer going to keep walking by. He is going to take action. And this is why it speaks in verse 9. It says, And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Israel had a problem with false gods. And the places that were once meant to worship the Lord, they were now places of worship to false gods. So the Lord's going to go through, He's going to destroy those places. He's also going to go against the house of Jeroboam, who was an unrighteous king, who did not do right in the sight of the Lord. He's going to come, He's going to destroy Eventually, once a nation gets to the point that they are so crooked, the Lord can no longer go and walk on by. The Lord takes action. He'll take action against their idols. He'll take action against their sin. As a, we continue on here, we see that a priest named by the, by the name of Amaziah right, makes some requests or demands of Amos. 
If you look at verse 10, it says, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. We have Amaziah here, a priest, and he sends writing to Jeroboam, the king, that Amos is causing problems. Now it is very likely, as what happens in every place where there is sin and the Lord's men and the Lord's people are preaching the word, when the Lord's prophet speaks out, speaks the word of the Lord, that there are those that are uncomfortable by. And those that would like to make that person or those people stop talking. We see that Amaziah is one of those people. He doesn't like what he hears. He doesn't like the word of the Lord that has been being given by Amos, and he wants Amos gone. So he writes to the king and tries to request of him, request of the king to take action on this. He accuses Amos of uh, treason against the king and against the nation, wanting to uh, overthrow the king and overthrow the nation. However, Amos never said that. He also makes mention here that Jeroboam will die by the sword. You know, if you look back just a couple verses earlier, the Lord says, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Amos did not actually say that Jeroboam was going to be taken by the sword. He says the house of Jeroboam. When you continue, uh, when you look elsewhere as well, we see that Jeroboam actually died by natural causes, and it is his son that dies by the hand of the sword. So we see that Amaziah actually twists the words of Amos to make it worse than it actually is. He also tells that Amos is saying that what Amos is saying is more than what the people of Israel can bear and what they can hear. But he's causing problems in the city. He's causing riots. Notice here, though, he completely leaves out all the things that Amos does for Israel. Now, we've just seen just a few verses before. And Amos is pleading on behalf of Israel for the Lord's forgiveness. And the Lord imparts his forgiveness upon Israel because of Amos making the request for them. As well, I do not think it would be hard to find time in Amos' life to see other places where he cared for Israel, wanted to help Israel, did good things in his community. But yet all of that is ignored because of the message that's being preached. You know, it should not surprise us when God's people are accused of hurting their country or causing problems. When people don't like the message that is being preached, when people don't like the Word of God, they're going to twist and change things to try and silence God's preachers, God's people. That's what they do. You know, you can look at uh, the news today, or look at social media, and you see that the agenda is always changing. The, the word, what, it, what happened, is always changed to fit the agenda of society. You will have people that make one mistake or do one thing that nobody likes and everybody will come up in arms against them. And will work as hard as they can to find problems. Everything that Amos preached was supposed to cause them to repent. However, they rejected it. 
For the world, even when we show our love, they will still reject it as hate. Those that are so deep in their sin will be blinded by it, so much so that they will not hear it. <laughs> Fulfilling what we see in John chapter 3, verse 19, that they love darkness rather than light, which causes them to reject the light. Because of their love for the darkness, for their love for the sin, they're going to reject the light. They're going to reject the things that are good for them. And this is something I want us to remember because the temptation is there to change the message or to uh, twist things to try and fit with, with, to make the world more comfortable with God's message. But no matter what you do, unless you get rid of God's message, the world is always going to see it as hate or they're always going to reject it because they love their darkness. We see that this takes place in Israel. They love their darkness. So the things that Amos did, the things that were meant to be love, that were love, were hate. And this is something I've talked about that I believe it all too close that the Lord's churches, true churches, to not be accepted by our society and to be illegal. And if you look through our society, if you look in our country, you see all the time where a very small portion within a group does something and our society ends up rejecting the entire group. You want an example? Look at our police. Look at our military. They will find a reason to hate what is good and to unend it. All it takes is one thing to happen and they will have enough to brand it as evil. Even if it isn't evil. As we continue, verse 12 says, And Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. But prophesy not against any more in Bethel, at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Amaziah, he comes to Amos, and he tells him, Hey Amos, it would probably be a good idea if you went to Judah. Probably a good idea if you went over there and talked about your stuff. And you know, he call him a prophet, he calls him a seer. And he says, why don't you just go over there and do your thing? Because, you know, really, it's probably not a good idea to you, for you to be here in the king's place doing things against the king, if you know what I mean. Basically, he's applying to him and say, hey, you should probably go over there because your life might be at stake here. You might lose something. You might be thrown in jail for staying here. You know, I think he probably also mentioned that I wrote to the king. He's going to take action. You might want to go ahead and get out of Dodge. Well, I find it sad here. Amaziah, he's a priest. And he's very like, he's a priest of the false god. But I can't help but wonder if maybe he had the opportunity to be a priest of the Lord, but yet he chose to be a priest of a false god. You know, there are those. He may have even been trying to say that he was a priest of the Lord. There are those who will fly under the banner of Christ, and place their name with the Lord, but in all actuality, they don't have anything to do with the Lord. They only can care, care about themselves. You know, though there are those that, because of their name on paper, they would you would think they would receive the Lord's work. They would be excited about the Lord's work, but yet they reject it, and they try to claim that it's not good. Look though in verse 14 what Amos' response is. He says, Then answered Amos, and 
and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Amos, he responds, and he says, So, you're here, you're threatening my livelihood, you're threatening me as a person, but I want to tell you something. I'm not a prophet because that's what my family did. I'm not a prophet because I wanted to make money as a prophet. My reason for being a prophet is because the Lord took me out of the place that I was in. My livelihood, what I had grown up doing and said, hey, go preach to Israel. My reason for doing what I do is simply because of the Lord. So what he's saying, he's saying, you can take my livelihood. You can throw me in jail. You can even kill me. But I don't care. Because my reason for doing all of this, my purpose is the Lord. That's why I'm doing this. Because the Lord has called me into it. I don't care about all those other things. So I'm going to stick around. There are those that claim to be preachers or those of the Lord that are in it for other reasons. But those that are preaching and teaching because of the Lord will stick with it regardless of their circumstances. The priority is not worldly things. The priority is the Lord. The right reason to do things for any Christian should be because of the Lord. And I'm going to say this as well. If your reasons are anything else except for the Lord, you're going to have a hard time doing things. You're going to have a hard time following the Lord's will. You're going to have a hard time teaching God's Word. Because all those other things... They go away. You'll have to sacrifice those things at some point. If you do it for the glory of people, for the praise from other people, there are going to be days where there will be no praise. If you're doing it for the money, ask some preachers. They'll tell you that you're in the wrong business. Whatever the reason is, all of those things go away. What remains constant is the Lord. Our reason for what we do needs to be because of the Lord. We need to be growing in our relationship with Him, growing in our understanding of Him, because the more that we grow in the Lord, the more energy and the more boldness and the more desire we're going to have to serve the Lord. I think far too often, the biggest reason that we have a shortage of people willing to do things for the Lord is simply because we have a shortage of people that have a strong relationship with the Lord. Their reason for doing what they do is not because of the Lord. It's for other things. This is why it's so important for us to disciple each other. It's why it's so important for us to attend services together and attend the classes so that we can learn about the Lord, so we can grow in the Lord. Because if you have a weak relationship with God, you're going to have weak motivation. Verse 16 17, we see Amaziah's punishment for his speaking against the word, Lord's work. He says, Now therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line. Thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. Amos speaks to Amaziah and he tells him, Because you have decided to speak against the Lord, because you've tried to stop his word, you have a punishment coming your way. First thing that I want us to notice is that this is the Lord's judgment that Amaziah, that Amos is preaching. You know, there's a, a, a big thing within the, for lack of a better term, Christian culture. We call it Christian pop culture. Because it's not real Christian culture. It's a big thing of you can't say anything against anything that anybody does because it's judging people and you're not supposed to judge. And I'm going to say this. The Lord says that we do not have any authority to judge people. But the Lord has made judgments. The Lord has established what is righteous and what is not righteous. When we teach God's word, when we teach the truths, we are teaching God's judgments. We are teaching what God has established. Amos wasn't teaching his judgments. He wasn't speaking out from his own understanding or his own thought processes. He was speaking what God said. And this is something I want you to remember as well. When somebody points out something in your life that, it, that needs to be corrected, and they are pointing that out because of what is in God's Word, they are not judging you. God is judging you. Now, I will say, Christ, when talking about judging people, also said that you needed to put a bigger look at yourself and take very seriously at the state of your end. So, before you go talking about God's judgments, make sure you are following God's word. Make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it doesn't mean just because... Just, Make sure that you don't have the problem that you're talking about. It means make sure you don't have other problems. You know, if you have a problem being disobedient with God in another area of your life, you need to be dealing with that. But at the same time, it is for us to speak God's word and speak God's judgments. Because whether people want to follow them now, they will have to follow them later. They will have to answer for them later. And they need to hear it. They need to know it. But for those that reject, they will receive God's punishment. In the case of Amaziah, we see that his wife becomes a harlot or a prostitute. <laughs> All of his children die by the sword or by war. His land is taken from him and divided. And then we see that he also is going to be taken to a polluted land, which means he's going to be taken to a new land that's not Israel, and that is where he will die. He will not be able to die in his home. And then to top it all off, he says, and Israel also is going to be taken into captivity. You can deny it all you want, but this is what's going to happen. Now, it's important to realize, you can deny your sin all you want. You can deny God being real all you want. You can deny God's power all you want. Want. You can deny God's standards all you want. You can deny God's path all you want. But in the end, what God has established is what is going to take place. The need is to respond to what He
is established. Seek the Lord. Ask of Him for forgiveness. Turn away from your life of sin and seek His path. Begin a new life in Him. Don't deny it anymore. And Messiah received his punishment because of his, him denying the Lord. Had he accepted the Lord, things would have been very different. Had Israel as a country changed their ways, things would have been very different. Do not think yourself exempt.